Hello, everyone. Welcome to Addressing Identity Censorship. My name is Holly Dotson, and I am the Education Coordinator for Comic Book Legal Defense Fund. CBLDF is a nonprofit organization dedicated to protecting the First Amendment rights of the comics art form and everyone who enjoys it and consumes it. That goes for um, retailers, publishers, creators, librarians, educators, and readers. We provide legal referrals, representation, advice, assistance, and education um, to further its, these goals. And we are a small organization and we are directly supported by our members um, and your contributions. If you're not a member, please join us or make a donation for one of our premium items. And if you are unable to make a donation, please support us in other ways. Uh, being part of our webinar series is one way, um, getting our spreading word about CBLDF via Twitter and Facebook. Um, you can follow us on those. Um, and also distributing our literature to your community. Our webinar series, which we are part of, we're doing today, is intended to provide practical advice to educators and librarians about how to incorporate comics-based curriculum and programming into their um, classrooms and libraries, and also to help retailers, um, comic retailers, better serve their communities as well. This webinar is going to be a little bit different than our other webinars. Uh, we are going to listen. We've, we've asked folks to join us who um, have been on the front lines of identity censorship, and their stories are going to help provide us um, and help us identify the contours of this issue and also help us identify the best, best strategies for managing it um, and the problems that arise from it. At the end of this webinar, we're going to give um, attendees the opportunity to share your stories and to ask questions, but also to share your own experiences so that you can um, receive face-to-face uh, -face advice on how to deal with these issues in your community. Before we get started, um, we would like to find out a little bit about you, attendees. Uh, if you could, there should be a option at the bottom of your screen to raise your hand. So I'm going to ask you some questions and get you to raise your hand. Um, how many of you out there are educators? Awesome. Yay, welcome. <laughs> Still have some, okay. I'm gonna lower your hands. And how many of you are librarians? Yay! <laughs> All right, how many of you are retailers? Any retailers? And can you share those numbers with us, Holly? Um, well, actually, I, it's, I don't have those numbers. It's going to show. Sorry, it'll show up at post. This stuff will show up post webinar. Can you see them? You should be able to see them on your screen. Nope, but it's okay. Let's keep moving. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's there. And the if you hit the participants button at the on the menu on your screen, it will show you the participants. Oh, great. Thank you. And then you hit attendees, and you can see their hands. Great. Thank you. Yeah. All right, and then last question. Um, anyone here who is just here because you're interested in the topic? Awesome, welcome to you as well. We have two of those folks. All right, awesome. So we will get started. I'm going to uh, let our panelists introduce themselves before we move on into our questions. So we can start with John. Oh, hello. Uh, my name is John Spears, and I am the Chief Librarian and CEO of the Pikes Peak Library District in Colorado Springs, Colorado, and my pronouns are he, him, his. Thank you. Charles? Hey, I'm Charles Brownstein. I'm the Executive Director of the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund, and I am a he, him, his also. And Lila. Hi, I'm Lila Sturgis. I'm a comic book writer, and my pronouns are she she, her, hers. Thank you all for being with us. Um, before we move into sharing experiences, I thought that Charles, um, if you would, mm -hmm. uh, give us some understanding of what we mean when we say identity censorship. What do we mean by that? And what are some examples? 
Sure, absolutely. Uh, well, first, I'd like to thank everybody for showing up today and wish everybody a happy Banned Books Week. We are at the uh, tail end of the annual celebration of the freedom to read. And in recent years, we've seen identity censorship as one of the dominant trends in the banned book space. And what we mean by identity censorship is censorship of an event or censorship of a book or other, uh, other sort of library material on the basis of who it's by or who it's for, not necessarily on the basis of the content. Uh, this is a new ripple in the challenge environment because you deal with cases of books like Drama uh, by Raina Telgemeier, which is a remarkable YA graphic novel about kids in a, uh, in a theater production being challenged because it has a gay character, uh, being challenged and saying that it's sexually explicit not because of any of the content of the book, but because of the makeup of one of the characters in there. This is an episode of identity censorship because the censorship is a result of the identity of some of the audience that it's for and not really about any of the content in the book. And recently we've seen a spread of moral panic about the identity of speakers within the library climate. So uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this uh, over the course of the conversation, but things like Drag Queen Story Hour or author disinvitations are occurring on the basis of the identity of the speaker, either coming from the LGBTQIA plus space or in some instances coming from underrepresented communities, communities of color and the like. So this is a trend that has been growing in recent years and that we hope this afternoon afternoon to discuss some strategies to win over some hearts and minds to help uh, quell the spread of identity censorship and also to make folks aware of the issue so that they can articulate it when they see it. Very good. Um, Lila, unfortunately, you've been on the front lines of this issue. And again, we thank you for being willing to share your experience with us. Um, could you tell us um, so that we can, again, understand the contours of this issue and, and how it affects folks. Could you share with us uh, what happened to you and um, just share your experience with us? Sure, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> around April of this year, I was invited to come to a youth uh, uh, book club at the Leander Public Library. And I was really excited to do it. I love talking to kids and I do it a lot. Um, I had just completed a book tour that had gone sort of all around the West Coast and up somewhere in the middle as well. And I'd spent a lot of time talking to kids, especially middle school kids that were so much fun. Um, and being an openly transgender woman, it created some you know interesting opportunities to interact with people and kids I found are you know very open-minded and very accepting. Um, the only qu real question that I got was one kid raised his hand and he said, um, so which bathroom do you use? <laughs> and I said, uh, well, I use the girls' room. And he said, okay, <laughs> and then we just moved on. <laughs> um, so I was excited to talk to these kids at the Leander Library and I had absolutely no inkling that anything could possibly go awry. It was a very common thing for me to do to go speak to kids. So on the day of the event, I was ready add play to the kids and um, some activities to do with them. And I got an email two hours before the event telling me that it had been canceled um, for um, Gosh, how, the language was very sort of vague. It was like canceled for unknown circumstances or something like that. Um, <clears throat> and I, at first I thought, oh, well that's, there must've been a scheduling error or, or something like that. It still hadn't occurred to me because I'm a little naive, still hadn't occurred to me that anything might be amiss. And when that started, occurring to me was when I went on Facebook to say that the event had been canceled, um, I started getting replies from people saying, some of them saying, well, that's a real shame. I was looking forward to bringing my daughter. Um, and then a couple of people started saying, oh, this again, this again with Leander, what's going on? And I looked into it and I found out that the month before there had been 
a drag queen story hour that had caused an enormous ruckus in the city of Leander. The event had been canceled, but then a church came in and rented a room in the building of the library and held it anyway. Um, and there were protests and it was this whole big mess. So it was sort of in that context. Um, and as we started putting the pieces together, um, it came out that the, um, an employee of the city, not of the library, had found, about, had found out about my appearance on that day and had immediately put a stop to it. Um, and he said to a reporter that if he had known that it was going to happen, he never would have allowed it in the first place. Um, so th <clears throat> that was troubling. And as these things started to come out, I, I started to talk to a couple of rep local reporters. Um, and I started to realize that this was because I am transgender. Um, it wasn't because of the book. It wasn't because of uh, anything else other than that I am a trans woman and they didn't want me there. And as more details came out over the next few days, that became clearer and clearer. Um, and, and people in the library, uh, the library staff members were opposed to this, but were overruled by the city. Um, and they all unanimously agreed that that was the reason for the cancellation. Um, and so it's funny because as all of these things were playing out, uh, I was in San Diego at San Diego Comic Con. And as this was sort of bubbling over, I won an award for the book that I was to be talking to the kids about. So it was a very bizarre set of emotions that I was going through as all this is happening with Leander. And then at the same time, I've got this really neat award. And I'm like, this is a, such a mixed bag of feelings. Yeah. Um, and then very happily, the, um, the CBLDF found out about the situation and stepped in. And I'm sure Charles can speak more to about what y'all did. Um, but that was really amazing because I, at that point, had absolutely no idea what to do. I had no idea how to respond. I felt powerless um, because it wasn't just, I wasn't just being harassed by some jerk on the street. I was being shut down by a government and I couldn't imagine what possible recourse I would have for that. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know who to contact. And, and someone suggested, hey, you should probably talk to the CBL. And before I had a chance to, I was contacted by y'all. Um, and I was very glad that I was because um, y'all stepped up and you had an action plan and you knew what to do. And I was extraordinarily grateful for all of that because like I said, I just didn't know. Thank you for, for sharing that. And again, I imagine as well, just like you said, this mixed bag of emotions, um, like this is a very, this would, that would, it would really hurt my feelings to be disinvited. Um, and yeah, um, Charles, could you talk a bit about what we did to, um, to, to try to um, make this right wrong? I mean, make this wrong right. Sure. <laughs> um, well, you know, first, I think it's important to acknowledge that in all of the cases of censorship, the people that kind of get shunted aside in the statistics are the people that are most affected by it. And so it's when we talk about the statistics of the most banned books or we talk about the disinvitation, the people that are most hurt are, you know, one, the library professionals or the education professionals that are trying to do their job, that are being, you know, having their judgment called into effect, uh, to the authors of the work that are being told there's something wrong with them and their work. And I think most distressing of all, the audience for this work, especially if they're kids that are being told there's something wrong with you because of the content that you're interested in or because of, you know, you identify with this or there's something wrong with the people that do identify with this. And so in all of our management of censorship crises, we're very sensitive to those audiences and those people and trying to make sure that everybody feels at ease and that we're able to help defuse the emotional, the heated emotional dynamics of the situation because it really is very fraught and very, very personal. And Lila's courage and uh, wherewithal to 
be part of the story um, was very heartening because all along it was about those kids that are being affected by this. And so that takes a lot of nerve and a lot of courage to be able to step up and participate in because when the story is about you, you know, that's an uncomfortable position to be in. And we should never take it for granted that, you know, people are going to be, you know, comfortable putting themselves in that space. So kudos to you, Lila, mm -hmm. uh, for doing that. Uh, in terms of the funds activities, we immediately developed a coalition response with our colleagues at the National Coalition Against Censorship, with whom we are the uh, sponsors of the Kids' Right to Read project, and developed a, uh, a, a letter campaign uh, to the Leander City Council indicating that uh, we have reason to believe that this was a discriminatory disinvitation and that uh, we were calling upon the library in the city to immediately reinstate uh, the event. Uh, within hours, we were joined with uh, new letters from the American Library Association and the ACLU, uh, who also chimed in on this. And uh, this went to the city council meeting where they basically deflected and said, we're going to table this issue for two weeks. Uh, two weeks later, we led a campaign online uh, to encourage the city to make right and uh, reinstate the event. Uh, one of the local city council people, uh, Christine Saderquist, also took up this charge. And it was really disheartening that at that city council meeting, they didn't address the substance of the issue that we were all raising, which is the right thing to do was to reverse their discriminatory action and reinstate Lila's event. They instead looked broadly at uh, meeting policies and decided to restrict access to the meeting rooms for the community. So the city council voted to restrict uh, meeting room access and also voted to impose a mandatory background check requirement for all speakers speaking to audiences under 18, which is not unheard of, but is unusual. And we understand that this emerges in the context of a moral panic there about Drag Queen Story Hour. So, you know, where we are now is, you know, sadly in a little bit of a holding pattern. The library's hands are tied because the city council overrules a lot of what they're able to do in setting the policies. And, you know, there's only so much influence that groups coming from outside of the local community are able to have on the decisions of the local community. Uh, we haven't given up. Uh, we are looking at options to hopefully try to restore this within Leander and if not, you know, hopefully provide access to Lila and her event uh, within the community through other means. Uh, but it is a an area where the first thing that you do is shine some light on the issue. The second thing that you do is build your partnerships and coalitions. And the, uh, the third thing that you do is you stay persistent and you keep up on the issue so that we can continue to serve the people that are most affected by this, who are, again, those professionals that are working within their professional expertise, and especially that audience of those kids that you know deserve access to professionals like Lila and deserve a space where they can see themselves reflected in the content within their communities. Yes, I was, um, <clears throat> if I can just jump on a little bit there mm -hmm. at the end, um, when you talk about the kids, um, I was contacted by several parents to express the disappointment from their kids, and it made me think about the LGBTQ kids out there who received this message, this implicit message that this woman shouldn't be allowed to speak in public spaces. And if she shouldn't be allowed to speak, what does that say about me? Um, and that was, that was when I started to get really upset. Um, that's when I started to get really angry. And that's what made me want to pursue this with vigilance rather than just let it get swept under the carpet. Right. And, and, and we remain committed on that end. And, you know, as, as we said, you know, this isn't the last you're going to hear of this story. And, you know, I think that we're going to be able to make some progress one way or the other, uh, you know, before the end of the season. But um, that is the important implicit message here is that if you're a, you know, preteen or a teen kid, and this is the model that's happening in your community, it just sends a terrible message about, you know, where you fit. And that's a difficult age to begin with.
And you know, if 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 you are a kid from the LGBT plus community, and you know you're already dealing with you know how difficult it is to be a teenager, and how difficult it is to be you know in this community in this planet right now, uh, and this is what's happening in in the community. I'm sorry, that's an un-American message for us to be sending. We have to fight it with vigilance, and I, I commend you on that. So John, speaking of drag queen story hour, uh, you have uh, you you have experienced a similar situation. Um, could you would you like to share with us, please, your experiences and the strategies that you took to deal with identity censorship in your library? Yeah, thank you, Holly. Um, I yes, uh, and I have a presentation to share if that's okay. Yay. <laughs> And um, one of the reasons that I, I'd like to share this presentation, um, let's see, did that work? Yes. Okay. Um, it's because there was quite a bit that we had to do um, with this that involved a lot of exchanges of, of emails and text. And so I'd like to kind of show some of those. So um, first, a little bit about the community that I'm in, because I think it kind of sets the stage for what happened here. And so Colorado Springs is the second largest city in the state of Colorado after Denver. It's a city of about half a million people. And it is an extremely, extremely conservative city. Um, and there's any number of reasons for that. But uh, one of the main reasons, especially uh, a, a conservatism from a, from a social perspective has to do with a lot of the groups that call Colorado Springs home. And let's see. And my presentation is not moving forward. There we go. Yay. Sorry. So Colorado Springs is the home of um, Focus on the Family, Young Life, um, Lomac Ministries, Compassion International, Family Policy Alliance, Navigators, uh, Christian and Missionary Alliance. And these are um, eight of the approximately around 90 uh, evangelical organizations that, cause, uh, that call Colorado Springs home. Now, I, I need to state that the library actually has really good relationships with these organizations, and we partner with them on some of the programs that we do. Uh, these are organizations that are vital to the health of Colorado Springs, and they're ones that we've always, we've always had pretty good relationships with. But uh, something happened last year that definitely uh, tested that and um, created some issues for the library. And that was a drag queen story time um, with Sarah Bellum that was supposed to happen, well, it did happen actually, on September 1st of 2018. So it was just a little over a year ago. And the interesting thing was that unlike a lot of other libraries, um, this wasn't actually our program. Um, we had been exploring the idea of doing a drag queen story time, um, but we weren't quite ready yet. And in the interim, actually uh, another group got together and decided to do a drag queen story time at the library themselves. So they booked one of our meeting rooms and we have about 40,000 uses of our meeting rooms every year. So we, to be honest, don't know a lot of, <laughs> a lot of what's going to be happening in our meeting rooms on any given day. And there was a Facebook, this was actually the Facebook um, ad that went out about the Drag Queen story time. And the library was not aware it was happening, but it was picked up by a group called the Family Policy Alliance, which is headquartered here in Colorado Springs. Unfortunately, I was in Malaysia <laughs> at the time um, at the uh, 84th. Uh, annual International Federation of Library Association World Library and Information Congress. Um, now, the good thing is that Malaysia is 12 hours difference uh, in time zones from Colorado. So I was perfectly capable of spending my day at the conference and then going back to my hotel. And right as I would have been going to bed, hey, that's okay. The work day is just starting in Denver. Um, so I uh, didn't sleep for a few days. But the other reason I bring this up is that um, this was something that in, in a way we were prepared for. We weren't necessarily prepared specifically for what's going to happen if a group hosts a meeting room, uh, hosts a drag queen story time in our meeting room. But 
intellectual freedom is something that we take extremely, uh, you know, it, it's something that is core to our mission here in Colorado Springs. We receive numerous challenges um, on everything from books to the programs that we do to displays that we do every June when we do pride displays. Um, you know, we get ready for the, for the, uh, the comments and the, and the complaints to come in. And so it's something that my staff and my board is, is well versed in the importance of intellectual freedom. So how it started was an action notice that the Family Policy Alliance sent out um, just a little bit before the program was slated to happen in September 1st. And it talked about how the Pax, Pikes Peak Library District is using your tax dollars to host a local drag queen story time for El Paso County children. Um, it said that it's being pushed by national transgender activist organizations and by the American Library Association. They'd done a story on it. Um, they talked about how a lot of libraries have been resistant to this, which was kind of news to me, um, but that it was concerning that the Pikes Peak Library District would, would, would host this. Um, so they have been working with the Colorado Family Action and they had an easy thing where you could click at the bottom of this and it would send an email to our Board of County Commissioners and the City Council for Colorado Springs. Now at this point they weren't even including the library in that. It was only going to the Board of County Commissioners and City Council. And so we found out about it when one of the city councilors actually contacted us. And this is the uh, email that they received. Um, they received hundreds, if not thousands of these emails. Um, quite a few of them were from people in our service area, but a lot of them were for people you know, all, all over the country. And um, you can see you know, what it says there, that they're sending this note to express deep concern about the Penrose Library hosting Drag Queen Storytime this Saturday. Uh, they talked that it was how bad it was that we were promoting it on our website. Um, what they meant by that was it, it was listed in the list of reservations that we had for, uh, for our meeting rooms. Um, and that it was scheduled right after the Penrose Library's own story time, uh, which is advertised for kids age three to seven. Um, these poured into City Council and the Board of County Commissioners, and we started uh, getting extreme political pressure to cancel this program, to not allow it to happen at the library. And so the first thing that we, we really wanted to do was get ahead of this, get our own, because there was a lot, by the time we even found out this was happening, there was so much information that was already out there that had been beyond our control. So we did issue a public response, um, basically just a press release that we gave to city council, we gave to the board of county commissioners, and, you know, we wanted to be as factual and honest as, pro as, as possible. Um, we didn't necessarily want to distance ourselves from what the program was, but we wanted to explain the facts that this was not our program, but that it is, was happening in the library and that our, that, that our meeting rooms are available to the entire public. All community members are allowed to use them as long as it doesn't violate our meeting room policy. Now, one thing we did actually put in there in the, the first paragraph, um, there was some pressure to say that, you know, we wouldn't do the program, but we weren't going to say that because we had been looking at a drag queen story time. And so we added the line, if it was ever offered or sponsored, the program would be a part of a larger exploration of diversity. Um, I didn't want to rule out that we would do this, do this down the line. So, but that, of course, uh, didn't quite do it. And this is when uh, a rather um, a, a heated exchange of uh, emails started coming from city council to the library and to the board. Uh, how we responded to these was we wanted to make sure that we were respectful and that we showed as much as we could an understanding of the issues that people were trying to raise, we didn't want to fight the negativity that was being hurled at us with more negativity. We wanted to try to be as positive about the situation and just make sure positive but firm in our resolute stand for the precepts of intellectual freedom. Um, 
So this was one of the first emails, and it was from one of our council members, a man named uh, you know uh, Andy Pico, um, who said basically that you know great, I've read your policy. You're just using that to justify it. That uh, we don't. He didn't think that we realized how offensive this was to a lot of the taxpayers um, who fund us, and at this point was just asking us to reconsider. Um, in some of the conversations, it was actually a little bit more forceful than that. And there were some, some thinly veiled threats towards the library about the, our board membership, about potential funding, potential funding down the line. And our response to this, and I apologize, this is the worst slide you can ever see in a PowerPoint presentation. Um, it is miles and miles of text. Uh, but there's a few things that I wanna hit in this because I think they're important in terms of how we did respond. Um, and we started off with a thank you, um, that we wanted to thank him for the service that he has as a council member, especially in times such as this. This could not have been easy for anyone on city council or the board of county commissioners because they were receiving a tremendous amount of pressure. And so we acknowledged that they had a groundswell of apparent opposition to this and that responding to it would be a daunting task. Uh, but we did also want to say that this is one that we share with you. Um, and we wanted to say that the feelings of the people who are espousing these views, even though personally I disagreed with them, that we didn't want to discount those feelings and we didn't want to minimize them or ignore them. But this is when we turned a little bit and started pushing back. And one of the things that we wanted to stress was that the taxpayers that are against this are only one side of the ledger. And there are taxpayers who are involved in the situation, who would be in support of this, the parents who want to attend this program with the children, the parent people who might just support this, or the ones who want to allow people the choice of attending or not as their conscience provides. And that this would be something that if we were to cancel this as a public library, it would only be recognizing the rights of one group of citizens and not all of them. One of the things that uh, we tried to continuously hit with this is that this wasn't a program that we were gonna be marching people in from the streets and forcing them to attend. People had the option of attending. That is something that very often gets lost. I know that for some, there's probably the view that, you know, the drag queens are gonna be going out, grabbing their children and bringing them inside and indoctrinating them. That's not what happens. So from there, we really wanted to uh, take it back to some of the core documents of librarianship, such as the Library Bill of Rights. Um, and you can see at the bottom of this is with nearly every policy that covers use for our collection services and facilities, it's based on the Library Bill of Rights, a foundational document of librarianship in this country. So we kind of tried to lay the groundwork there, but then we wanted to make sure that people understood that this was not something that we were gonna back down on. And this was when, why we included the statement, intellectual freedom and the ability of people to use libraries to seek information without interference from those who might disagree with their beliefs or principles that are not negotiable. It is the same philosophy that would protect the Family Policy Alliance or those that agree with them were they to utilize their meeting rooms as a vehicle for propagating their views. We contacted the Family Policy Alliance. We said, if you would like to do a, if you would like to use one of our rooms and do a biblical story time, we would welcome it in the library. Um, of course, there was no response to that, but we wanted to make sure that they realized that intellectual freedom is not just something that we're using to protect the views that we support. They support that intellectual freedom exists for everyone. Um, and so that's why, that's how we ended it. Our refusal to cancel this program is not just to protect the rights of those putting on Drag Queen Story Hour, but is also to ensure that those rights will exist for all residents and taxpayers of El Paso County, including those who would seek to shut this program down. Now, this email was one that um, we tried, like I said, to, we tried to remain positive while being firm. I'm going to be honest, uh, behind the scenes and in conversations with each other, we weren't always positive. We, we, we did have to vent about what was going on with each other, but we made sure that that never was done publicly or that there could never be anything that said that we were just against these, or, these organizations because of, 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 of their beliefs. Anything that went out, any comment that we made um, was never done alone. Um, if I wrote an email, it was reviewed by the, my president of the board of trustees. If she wrote an email, I reviewed it. Um, there were times where we would get on the phone and say, 
great email, let's tone it down a little bit. <laughs> and that helped tremendously. So I would like to say that, uh, that in those incredibly poetic and inspiring words made all the difference in the world and city council backed down and realized that intellectual freedom should be celebrated and cherished and they were wrong. That isn't what happened. Um, this, <clears throat> this was his, uh, his response. Um, I could not disagree more strongly. Uh, this program is targeting children. And I think that crosses a pretty significant threshold. In my view, this constitutes child abuse. Um, the third line of the third paragraph of this was the one that, uh, that, that got me. Um, I've rarely been more disgusted by people pretending to serve the public while abusing their public responsibilities. Um, I actually had a staff member that made me a t-shirt with that line emblazoned across it uh, because it was kind of a mark of pride. Now, getting an email like this um, was not easy, uh, you know, saying that, you know, that uh, we're basically disgusting public servants was not an easy thing to read. But at the same time, we did not respond in kind. Um, the one thing we never did is we didn't actually argue the merits of Drag Queen Storytime. We didn't want to get into, because we knew we would not be able to convince him of the merits of the program. We stuck to intellectual freedom. We stuck to the precepts that this program has a right to go on and we cannot censor this program because of who's presenting it, who it's being presented to, or the subject of the program. So uh, Council Member Pico kind of took it up a level and sent it to the mayor um, and to everyone on city council. and tried to really broaden his target beyond just the library. Um, and this is when things got weird. Uh, not that they weren't already pretty weird, but all of a sudden the library was accused of hacking into the system of the Family Policy Alliance. And um, that the supporters of the Drag Queen story time, all of a sudden the tables were turned on us and there was talk that the hostile attacker using false emails to discredit the First Amendment freedom of speech of the Family Policy Alliance, which I think was a little bit ironic given what was going on was that we were being accused of violating people's free speech rights. At that point, my board president got involved and um, she'd been involved all along, but she just wrote back a very straightforward email to all of them. Um, once again, starting off by thanking him for his service to the community and uh, the requests to cancel it had been coming in like there was no tomorrow. And she let people know that the Board of Trustees supports the decision to allow the program to continue. Um, and she directly said that this would be censorship if we didn't. Um, one of the things that helped the most was that we made sure we have 500 staff in our library district. Um, we cover about 2,000 square miles and serve about 650,000 people. Uh, so we have everything from a large urban core city to 1,000 square miles of rural farmland and, and ranches. The staff was not actually comfortable with, with our stance on this. And so we wanted to make sure that they had talking points, that everyone was speaking from the same sheet. So that, uh, because the staff were getting comments, of, comments and questions about this when they were at the grocery store, there was any number of things that were coming up where people were asking people, how do you feel about this? What do you think? And we didn't want to necessarily, of course we didn't want to censor the staff, but we wanted to make sure that they had some talking points and some sound bites that they could use. So that they were, weren't comfortable talking about this or if they didn't know what to say, that we would at least all hopefully be saying the same thing. The other thing we did was that we let the staff know that it was okay if they disagreed with us. That, um, and we sent an email out and, and we talked to staff and we invited staff to meet with members of the leadership team. If you don't agree with us on this, let us talk to you. And I had four staff members do it. And um, by the end of it, they, they all were at least somewhat on board. The other thing we found, um, because uh, I should say, I, everything by, up to this point, I've been talking about emails, there were a lot of calls that were coming in, <laughs> um, a tremendous amount of calls that were coming in. We stopped responding to the emails um, and then uh, individually and started just doing pat responses after we'd written a couple hundred responses to the emails. 
Um, the phone calls, what we found was if we actually had an opportunity to talk to people about what this was and talk to them about why we were doing what we're doing and why we were allowing this program to continue, they were, they eventually became supporters. I think almost without exception, the people that we talked to, that we had the opportunity to actually have a conversation with, by the end of that conversation, they got it. They understood the importance of intellectual freedom and how it was there not just to protect people, whether they are gay, lesbian, straight, transgender, a drag queen, it didn't matter. It was there to protect everyone. So this was the actual part of the first event. Now, one of the ironic things uh, when a program like this gets challenged, um, if it hadn't been challenged, there might have been 20 people there. Since it was challenged, there were 300. Um, about 300 people showed up, families from all over the region, all over Colorado Springs, all over El Paso County, showed up for this program. We had 300 people there, they had to do it twice. We had three protesters, that was it. But the board came, all the members of the board came to make sure everything was okay. Um, we did actually have a city council member who showed up to see it. And he left a fan. He actually left saying that this, he gets it. This is a good program. So with him, it moved beyond intellectual freedom into just seeing what this program can mean for the community. This, um, it, but th th that was not the end of it by, by any stretch because this was just the first of the drag queen story times. They're gonna be month, they're, they're, they were gonna be monthly. Um, there was a group that formed in Colorado Springs uh, called Mothers Against Drag Queens and Libraries, um, or MADQUIL. And this is from their, uh, what, what I call their recruitment brochure. Um, but it is, a, it, it's, it's pretty disturbing uh, when you actually read it and, and, and you look at it. Um, but this, uh, this let us know that this was not gonna be the end of it. And, and it wasn't, although things kind of calmed down after the first one, this is one side of it, this is, this is another, um, you know, and we allowed them to distribute this if they were outside the library. We don't allow pamphleteering inside the library, but we do allow, out, do allow it outside. And um, so, you know, we, we saw a lot of these pamphlets, we'll just say that. <laughs> but even that wasn't the end of it. Um, on September 11th, they wrote uh, another article about it, and uh, we still get comments. Um, we still, this was still brought up. I recently had a meeting with the mayor, uh, or the mayor's chief of staff about something else. And the subject of drag queen story time still came up um, as one of those things that he just didn't quite approve of that the library did. So, you know, there's gonna be repercussions for the Pikes Peak Library District and the fact that we did allow this program to go on, but there's no question that we still would, it, it, you know, it wouldn't matter we would do the same thing again. And this is uh, one, of the, one of the more recent ones um, that happened here. And it was an incredible, an incredible drag queen that read The Very Hungry Caterpillar. And as you can see, she had on one of the most beautiful uh, butterfly outfits. So you can kind of see where The Very Hungry Caterpillar and, and how she tied it in. So that was how we responded to this. And it's something that uh, we've tried to adopt in terms of how we respond to every challenge because increasingly we are seeing more challenges when it comes to the identity of, of the creator or artistic work or the presenter of a program. I, I, I would agree that with Charles that this is happening more and, and more frequently. So thank you. You gotta unmute yourself. Holly. Yeah, yeah, I know I was doing it. I was like, yay. And thank you so much, John. That was that was great. And again, I want to commend you on using language that is inclusive. You're still in you're you're not excluding anyone in the language you use and you're kind and um and and still straightforward. It's it was yeah, kudos. Um so so John's presentation outlines um strategies. Um, he discusses uh, both gives examples of the types of language to um, to include discusses how you should talk to folks before you send don't you know hit send or, or let other people review because these are emotional 
these are emotional uh, subjects. And um, so Charles, could you build on that a little bit? I know you've, you've talked about um, the specifics of, of um, what we did in Lila's case, um, but could you talk and build on what John um, spoke on and provide us with some more information about what steps one should take um, to manage similar challenges? What's, where's the first place that we start? Who do we contact and what do we do? Absolutely. Uh, I want to build on a point that John made that I think is uh, really important here, which is don't necessarily presume bad faith in the people that are coming uh, with objections to a particular kind of program. Uh, this is an opportunity to be inclusive and to bring people into a community mindset. So if we start from a point of view of we stand firm by these policies and principles of intellectual freedom. Uh, we appreciate um, your point of view as somebody exercising your intellectual freedom, but the com entire community needs the right to make up their own minds about their own minds. You know, this is an important place to start. Be empathetic, be kind, be courteous, but be firm by your policies. Uh, the second piece is to, if you are a library education professional, understand your policies. Uh, you know, perhaps if you're an administrator, do some refreshers uh, if you're not already doing them, um, you know, a couple times a year just to get everybody on the same page with how this works. If you don't have uh, policies, there's some great resources that are gonna be going out in the toolkit that everybody here will get that the American Library Association has provided on building policies uh, that you can be using um, within, your library and your library system. So rely on your policies, follow your policies, be empathetic. Uh, should a First Amendment emergency occur, you're not alone. There's a lot of organizations out there that are able to help you in a variety of ways. The Comic Book Legal Defense Fund is one of a broad range of organizations that is specifically dedicated to supporting the free expression rights of communities all over the United States. Our particular window of expertise tends towards comics and graphic novels, so we're able to provide a lot of resources about the format and the applications within the format. Uh, as a partner in the Kids' Right to Read project, we also have some expertise more broadly, so you can reach us at cbldf.org or 888-88-CBLDF. Uh, and reach out, we'll be able to help you uh, immediately with that. But beyond the fund, there's also the American Library Association and their Office of Intellectual Freedom, who does a tremendous amount of great work. Um, there's the Freedom to Read Foundation. I see Emily Knox is on our call here. She, was, uh, she followed me as the president of the Freedom to Read Foundation. They have useful tools. There's the National Coalition Against Censorship uh, as well. All of these groups are here to help. So if you do have a challenge, reach out to the group that is nearest the issue uh, as soon as possible, because the sooner we get involved, the sooner that we can help provide some guidance behind the scenes, the sooner we can help be that sounding board, perhaps, that John is describing that you need in these cases. And there are certain things that an outside group can do that is productive in a way that is not necessarily productive coming from within the community. So for a group like CBLDF or NCAC to send a letter indicating this is the First Amendment and this is how the First Amendment governs this particular kind of a situation, it allows us to take the heat of being the heavy in these situations and provide a certain amount of air cover for the people on the ground in the community whose judgment is being called into question. And that's something that many of us are able to do. Uh, CBLDF and NCAC do it all the time. Uh, we also have some expertise and some access to legal resources mm -hmm. that we can connect you with. So in summary there, in the event of a First Amendment emergency, reach out immediately to the groups whose specific job is to help you. CBLDF is one of them. The American Library Association is another. The National Coalition Against Censorship is still another. And the Freedom to Read Foundation is still another. And then finally, to close and come kind of full circle in this, what John said, we're all people. And in these kinds of cases, it's really easy to get stuck into the emotions of the ideologies that are being presented. But we're all people who sincerely believe that we're doing the right thing. And so the key is to take some breaths, respond when you have the capacity to respond calmly, and respond on a heart-to-heart -heart level with the folks that are objecting 
uh, pointing out that, you know, hey, we're all on the same team here. We might have some disagreements. You know, we may not be brothers and sisters, but we are neighbors and we have a common cause and we're going to build that common cause. And if you can do that, as John encountered, you know, when you talk to people, you will often be able to win them over because everybody wants to be heard. And oftentimes the people making an objection, they just want to be heard as well. Thank you, Charles. And that's actually a beautiful segue into us possibly opening it up for Q&A because we want other people, <laughs> attendees, to be heard as well. Um, we're going to try something new today. Um, I want to give you all the opportunity to share your experiences uh, with us out loud instead of typing them. So uh, if you, I have the capacity to allow you to talk, um, you don't have to be seen if you don't want to be. Um, but if you do, if you would like to share your experience, attendees, uh, please raise your hand and then that will give me the ability to allow you to, uh, to talk and share your experience with us and the rest of our community. Awesome, yay. All right, Elvira, you are, you should be able to talk now. Hi there folks, thanks for uh, doing this. I really appreciate you. Uh, I write uh, I, I write a series of uh, education comic books. Uh, the first one was called Elvis Canaveral Super Collider. It was a guide to the selection and use of microphones for on-stage presentations. And the, the host of it uh, is uh, Elvis Canaveral. He appears as a big Mexican dude because the artist who I collaborated with it is a big Mexican dude. And I wanted them to have representation in their work. And uh, when it came to me putting together my uh, pinball, pinball comic book guides, I uh, used it as an opportunity to give, uh, since I was the artist on it, I used it as an opportunity to give uh, voice to my feminine identity. So their Elvira Canaveral illuminates the Adams Family Pinball Mansion. Uh, and... Uh, Part of it was I had to have a kind of a character in a safe place to give voice to Elvira Canaveral because I had to be very careful in my representation of it because I didn't want to make somebody else's journey more difficult with my own jackassery, <laughs> if that makes any sense. It's a great uh, word. Because being, being seen as a white cis male uh, I didn't want to end in having a feminine identity, but not body dysphoria. So having that unique uh, challenge of trying to have a voice, but not use that voice to confuse anybody else's message or to make anybody else's journey difficult. Uh, is a uh, is kind of a mindful consideration that I had to place coming into the situation, but it also kind of because I'm on a mission of radical inclusion pinball. The idea that pinball is for everybody, and uh, and, and uh, when trying to give voice and representation uh, to it, it also allowed me to kind of take the brunt of what would be the haters who would attack the more vulnerable communities because I was in a position of strength and being able to define how it affected me and how I allowed it to interpret my work uh, uh, put me into a more powerful position of representation and defense because it allowed me to establish the rules in which uh, 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 this engagement had occurred and, and in an attempt to, to uh, uh, actively detoxify both my two favorite art forms, pinball and comic books, which just have a history of uh, toxic masculinity. So, uh, and when Thanks. it comes, thank you. So, uh, but uh, this was an opportunity to give voice and representation to it, but I also had to do it on my own terms because it wasn't something I could trust a partner publisher uh, to do with because it was a, a very much a personal representation and it didn't fall into traditional boxes. So. Thank you. Th thank you for sharing. Are, are is anyone else 
like to share experience or does anyone have a question? I see some QA, Holly. Okay. There we go. Yay. All right. So this is from Mark and it's directed to John. Would you recommend libraries have books with transgender characters for kids to be able to see themselves in the book characters? Um, that, that's a really easy one to answer. Uh, yes. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I would. I think that children's literature is probably um, one of the most vital things to have adequate representation of the full cross-section of humanity in. Uh, children need to see themselves in the, in the literature that they read, and they need to see themselves, whether it's picture books up through chapter books. Um, there is an increasing amount of children's literature that allows uh, GLBT QIA children to see themselves and to see themselves not necessarily as, um, I'm trying to think how to say this. There's been a bit of a shift away from the GLBT character as, uh, as unusual or as it just hits home that this is all about the fact that this child is GLBT. And what you're seeing more and more, and I think this has been a tremendous development, is that that is actually just a part of who they are. And so it's allowing children to see themselves in the same way that everyone else does, that this is just one facet of who they are. It's something that makes them incredible and amazing, but it is just one facet instead of it being everything. And um, if you need some titles, I'd be more than happy to put you in touch with my children's uh, services specialist. Full disclosure, I am not even remotely a children's librarian. They don't let me near them. Um, <laughs> uh, you don't want to see me do a story time. It is a horrible and scary. Thing. Can I jump in on the tail of that? Yes, please. Since this is a topic that's extremely relevant to me, um, one of the things that I, I like to say when I talk about Lumberjanes is how beautiful it is that Lumberjanes has a transgender character. And that character, um, while she is trans, her transness is just, as you were saying, uh, John, one small part of her identity, um, albeit an important part. And one thing that I like to point out is that if I had had a book like Lumberjanes when I was young, when I was 9, 10, 11, 12, it would have changed the course of my life dramatically. That instead of growing up feeling as though there was something deeply wrong with me, I could have grown up believing that I was just one type of person um, that was just as acceptable as any other type. Yeah. And if you don't mind me building on that, I think that it's also really healthy to have a broad range of representations for all readers to have because at a certain, you know, at, at a certain point, you're just reading a book because it's a great book. And the more that great book reflects the world around you, the more thought leadership and, uh, and, and modeling that's being done for how to interact and how to behave in the world, which is really important as well. It doesn't all need to be a, a very special after school special. Yeah. <laughs> very good. Well, uh, this is from an anonymous attendee. It says, I used to work for a library system in Colorado that shut down at least three drag queen story times. I have since left the system, but is there any advice on how to help those who are still there? So how would you help folks who are, who are still, when you're no longer part of the system, or is there any suggestions there there's a lot to unpack in that one yeah there is uh, to, to be perfectly honest um it, you know that needs uh, w without knowing the library system i'm not asking that question um but a lot can depend on is it a district library is it a city library um or is it a county library? You know, I'm lucky enough where I work for a library, Pike Speak is a library district, so we have a lot of autonomy to some extent. Um, sometimes you, you know, without knowing where the decision is coming from, um, is this a decision that is being pressed down from city or county government on an unwitting library that actually the administration of the library disagrees with that decision? 
I would just say offer them whatever support you can. Um, it, it, that's not much of an answer, but without knowing more of the situation, uh, I would say just try, just try to be there for them. Give them the resources they need that explain why programs such as this are vital to the development of children and the development of the community. Hopefully, with enough information, they'll be able to persuade the library to, to change their mind. Thank you, John. Um, and ne our next question is from Danny. It says, what are some good ways to advertise as a retailer that you are a safe place and carry diverse titles and are welcoming to, to readership? Uh, I often find that it takes someone coming through the door and engaging in conversation with them to get them to open up. So I feel that I'm sure there are others out there who might be too shy to speak up or perhaps don't come in because they're worried about potential exclusion. Charles, would you like to address this? Well, there's a lot that you can do in um, just how you design your store and how you uh, manage your display spaces. Uh, there's a lot that you can do in uh, hosting certain kinds of events. Uh, if there's folks in your community that are motivated to do perhaps book clubs, um, you know, and letting them self-select that content and use your space, that's a good way to uh, be involved. Uh, I'd, I'd refer you to our book, uh, Selling Comics, which does a good job going into detail on these kinds of issues for retailers. And Lila, I saw that you're going to have to step off shortly, but perhaps you'd like to build on that question or make any, uh, any final comments or make yourself available for any final questions. Sure, sure, sure. Um, in response to that question, I know that um, one nice thing about living in Austin, Texas is that there are a lot of uh, businesses that are openly advertised their um, their diversity and um, sometimes just a sign in the window saying we welcome everyone. I've seen several different variations of that sign um, and it's nice for me to see. Um, and there's a local comic book shop called Austin Books that has a very large display of LGBTQ books um, which also feels very welcoming, I think. So I think ev I would just underscore everything that you just said. Um, <clears throat> and yes, if anyone has any questions for me before I have to run, that would be great too. So if you do go ahead and use the raise your hand function and we'll prioritize those and then uh, check off good. the rest of the Q&A. Mm -hmm. So questions for Lila, raise your hand. Okay. Okay. Looks like Hi. you're off the hook. Yeah. Hi. Thank you so much for attending, Lila. Thank you. Oh, really so appreciate it. Okay. This was a treat. Yeah. Oh, Mark. Mark, do you have a question specifically for? We'll just put you on. Allow you to talk. There we go. Mark, you are. Yes. You are you, on. Yay. A uh, question for Lila. I have a transgender child, and I'm just wondering. Um, they're 15 now. Are there any book recommendations or particular authors you would recommend for them? Oh my goodness. At 15, 15 is such an interesting age to be trans, especially these days. Um, there is, um, you know, some of the books out there, there isn't an impressive variety out there. Um, there's some books that I can think of that feature transgender characters would be Kim and Kim by Mags Visaggio. Um, and, um, also, of course, Lumberjanes, although Lumberjanes might skew a little young for that kiddo. Um, Kim and Kim would be great. Gem and the Holograms, um, that's drawn by Sophie Campbell, who I'm noticing works that are, um, either written or drawn people themselves. Um, the trans books that I see are a lot more likely to be found in the indie comic space and those can be anywhere but i would suggest because i'm even i am not as conversant as i could be um you know that i know that there are lists online and if you have a really good comic book shop in your area you might want to get in touch with them as well um one more question for you lila before you go from monica she asked how do we go about booking you at at our libraries <laughs> <laughs> I would um, love to, I'm more than happy to be booked. Um, the easiest way to get in touch with me is to either email me at lila.sturgis at gmail.com 
or you can contact me on Twitter where I'm very easy to reach. Um, I love doing library appearances and I'm always uh, excited to do them. Lila.Sturges at gmail.com, correct? I'm gonna post that into uh -huh. our chat so that folks will have your email address. Thank you. That's it. Thanks, Annika. Yeah. Awesome. So moving right along and Lila again, thank you. And you can, whenever you need to leave, please do so. Okay. We appreciate well, your time. Thanks to all of you, um, Holly for organizing this and Charles for all your help over the past couple of months. CBLDF has been a real godsend and I appreciate everyone who joined in. Thank you for being here. You're fabulous. We'll see Bye. you later. Bye. Bye. <laughs> All right, so we'll move on to Danny's question. It says, what are some good ways to add our weight? No, we just answered that one. Sorry, Danny, we'll move. Um, Mark, you have another question here. It said, would there be a best practice for trying to get the books into school libraries in conservative South Dakota, or would the likely consequences outweigh the benefits? Um, Mark, are you an educator or a librarian? Uh, yes, I am. A, I'm an educator. I uh teach children's literature at Dakota State University. Okay, um, so yeah, so getting, so you're not in the public schools, it, you would need, you'd need to have um, representation in the schools, it would be a, an educator in the schools themselves, um, and that's, that's your best option for getting, um, for getting books into, or if your child is at the school as well, if you have well, a child in the school. that would be kind of like a school by school process. Do you think it, there's a way of doing it, you know, in mass? So there's 300 school libraries in South Dakota and you know what if there was like three to four books that we said gee it'd be nice if every school library could have this or do you have to do it one by one or do you think trying to do it in mass would cause a, a backlash? Charles would you like to you probably have more experience with the legal of, aspect of that? A lot of this just varies on a community to community basis. So it's it's very difficult to opine about South Dakota where I'm not expert, you know, in these areas. And oftentimes these things begin in a school by school basis. Now, you know, if there's anybody that's in our attendee list that has some expertise that would like to speak to this issue, we, you know, welcome you to speak up on it. Uh, but, you know, generally speaking, you know, this stuff uh, that's community driven uh, bubbles up from the community and, and moves slowly, but that's, uh, you know, slow incremental progress is uh, the kind of progress that sticks, generally speaking. Okay. Thank you, Mark. All right. Um, so from an anonymous attendee, how would you go about incorporating a book with LGBTQ themes into a regular story time, knowing that there's the possibility of community members objecting to the content? And not necessarily a pride themed story time, but I think they're asking just general day to day story times. And Tell me that. Yeah. please. Yeah. Yes. Um, so if you're doing a story time and you are going to be incorporating something like that into it, I think that the first thing to think about um, is. It, it, for, well, let me start off. I think it's a wonderful thing to incorporate that into a story time. Uh, I do think that it would be wonderful if um, we could move away from Pride Month to Pride Year. And I have to have, you know, that LGBT themes can only be discussed in the library in June of every year. Um, how we would go about that, I can tell you, at the Pikes Peak Library District, uh, it's not so much the incorporation, it's just if you think there's going to be the community objecting to it, be prepared for what those objections are. Um, if you're going to move forward with it, what I would suggest would be incorporate it as, in terms of a broader array of diversity. When we were looking at doing uh, Drag Queen Storytime internally as our own program, how we did want to approach it was to do it as part of a broader exploration of different types of humanity that people might not be aware of, that people might not be familiar with. So for instance, we were thinking that, well, let's do a drag queen story time, a story time um, uh, with someone from the local Islamic center, um, even down to 
inviting, we actually were thinking, let's invite Focus or Family Policy Alliance or a group like them to do a, 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 a Christian, a Bible-based story time. I think that if you narrow it with such a focus that it is just a GLBT story time, um, that is when a lot of the objections might come. But if you do it as part of something broader, something bigger, something of an exploration beyond just GOBT to a whole range of things that children might want to see themselves represented in. How many, how many story times do you ever see where they actually talk about divorce, where they actually talk about adoption, where they actually talk about a lot of things that children want to see themselves portrayed in but don't necessarily get the chance in a traditional story time where to be perfectly honest, everything is a happily married heteronormative couple. So I think that that is one way you can do it is to actually show it as a part of almost a spectrum of the human condition. But really, <laughs> it's not so much doing it it's having a really solid unified front, having your board, your staff, your administration, everyone be prepared with a uniform and concise and clear message about why you did it and what you were hoping to accomplish. And it doesn't have to be hitting people over the head with GLBT rights. It can just honestly be a statement as, we wanna reflect the children that come to our story times. And this was our way of doing it. Yeah, I'd emphatically co-sign all of that. And especially the notion that our job as intellectual freedom professionals is to reflect the world around us. And sometimes reflecting the world around us means you just, this stuff just happens to sneak in because it's part mm -hmm. of the content. And, uh, oh, really? You noticed that there was a gay character in this story? Okay. You know? Like drama is a great example of that. That's not the point of the story. It just happens to be an element of the story. And the more that, you know, the world that we are articulating with the programming decisions that we make reflects the world around us, uh, the more we're able to accurately and adequately reflect our communities in a way that it's not a sensation to see somebody from an LGBTQ plus group or to see somebody uh, from a a non-majority faith group or to see somebody from a non-majority ethnic group reflected uh, in the content, which is how our communities look and work. Thank you. Our next question is, what are the best tax tactics, sorry, words, words are hard. What are the best tactics to turn censorship into attendance? John, you want to try, you want to take that first? Or you want me to take that first? Uh, you know, th this is a question that I'm, once again, I might need a little bit more information on. It, 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 I'll be honest, but it's been my experience that censorship pretty much becomes attendance. Um, <laughs> events that are censored, uh, censorship usually does not necessarily happen in silence. Um, a lot of times, at least the censorship that I've uh, experienced in libraries, such as what the attempt was with the drag queen story time, very often it, it, it's very public. And um, when you, I mean, one thing I didn't talk about when I was talking about what we did is we actually did reach out to groups such as PFLAG and some of the other local groups here in Colorado Springs um, for their support. And as a part of that, uh, that support was not just in terms of letter writing, but that support was also in terms of having, of, of acting as positive ambassadors for the event as well. Um, so the, just the process of someone trying to censor you very often it, when you're dealing with it, when you're building the coalitions to help fight it, when you are responding to it, and very often with the advertising that the people who are trying to censor it are doing, um, it's going to create, it, it, it's going to create attendance. That, that's been my experience, but, you know. <laughs> I'd agree with that. And I would also really caution against sensationalizing the censorship aspect of it because there's a lot of uh, uh, negative unintended emotional consequences for the community as well. Uh, you know, I think again, with Banned Books Week and other sorts of uh, events like that, there is this kind of sensationalized, ooh, what got, what got banned? I want to read that. And it's really putting an emphasis on uh, the subversive element of it, mm -hmm. uh, which there's a place for to be sure. 
but uh, you know, oftentimes, you know, it's it's the folks that are um, quietly feeling themselves being uh, judged that are hurt by these kinds of things. So I think we need to be really sensitive in uh, in how we handle these matters. Can I add? Can I add one thing Please. to that really quickly? That was something that we were very that, that we were cognizant of when we did when the drag queen story time was happened. The one thing that we didn't want to have happen was we knew that the parents that were going to be coming to this and bringing their children, whether the children themselves might be exploring, um, you know, their own identity, or whether their parents might just want to, you know, expose them to something broader. We didn't want it to become a carnival. We didn't want it to become a festival. So attendance is, is you know, it, it's great if you have a lot of people show up for a program, but as quickly as possible, we tried to move away from this program being this, you know, cause celeb of, 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 of oppression against the poor library district. That was not the intention. Our intention was as quickly as possible to return this program to normalcy. And it, it was great that 300 people showed up, but a lot of those people showed up to support it, no question about that. But this program wasn't for them. This program was for the parents and the children to enjoy a drag queen story time. And so attendance can be a double-edged sword. You don't want a huge crowd necessarily because the program has an intention. You want to make sure that you can respect that. Yeah, I was wondering how did you manage 300 people at a story time because normally <laughs> story times are like 30 people at the most. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, and, and this is what, you know, a lot of the people did come because they wanted to show their support. Mm -hmm. And they were great because they did realize pretty quick, hey, this is not for us. This is, this is for the kids. Mm -hmm. and, and this is for the families. And so that, that helped tremendously. Yeah. 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 That's a lot of folks. <laughs> Um, our, our next question is, uh, I read Worm Loves Worm during a story time once and was confronted by a parent after the fact, asking why I'd read the story and how she thought it might confuse the kids. In the moment, I got a bit flustered and sort of flubbed the talking points I had ready for, for the situation when it came up. Do you have any tips for handling that on-the-spot kind of situation? So the... Um, the, the question is basically that they had the talking points, but then they didn't execute them as well. Is there some, some advice for how to execute those when you're in that middle of the on the spot situation there? Breathe, ground yourself. I, you know, here, here's the thing in these kinds of situations and I've managed a lot of angry parents in my life uh, that are, you know, upset because we were advocating for a book like this one summer, you know, and they don't want their kid reading it. I get it. I get it. It's tough to raise a kid in this world. And it's tough to raise a kid when, you know, you've bought them one of these and they have access to all of the universe of stuff that you can get in one of these. And you can't control that, but you can control the book. And so I've been on the other end of the phone call getting yelled at, well, this book has R-rated stuff in it. Well, no, it doesn't. But okay, first thing I'm going to do is just let you talk and find your own center. You know, take your time. You don't need to respond with the same emotional pitch that you're being met with. And a lot of this is self mastery and a lot of this is practice and working with your coworkers and developing perhaps some training exercises uh, that allow you to workshop these scenarios will help you get better at it. But, you know, check in with yourself and with your body. You know, breathe catch your breath, take your time, uh, you know, pull yourself out of the emotional environment that you're being put in and fall back on, I'll speak when I'm ready to speak and I'm gonna speak from the heart when I'm ready to speak from the heart, which is a little bit hippie, I understand. But, you know, sometimes, you know, you need to call in to your spiritual self to respond intellectually in these moments to achieve your best result. Uh, John, maybe you can do something a little bit less Oregon hippie than uh, than I just did. <laughs> um, no, I, I think I was going to move to a pretty self-help place as well. Um, you know, definitely pause. Just, just, just take a moment. 
And, um, you know, I'll, I'll go back to, you know, kind of an answer I gave to a previous question or, or a spin on it. Rehearse you know, actually practice how to handle these situations. If you're going into a situation where you might be reading a, a, a book such as Worm Loves Worm, and you know that there it, it could be contentious with some of the parents, actually practice with someone. How, how would I handle this situation if it, if, it, if it came up? There's nothing wrong with ro role playing. The other thing, and this is actually kind of another delay tactic as you, as you center yourself, as Charles said, which I totally agree with, um, instead of having to launch right into your, whether it's calm or whether it, well, well, hopefully calm, defense of intellectual freedom and the value of, the, of, of this work, take a moment to, if you can do it, to sincerely acknowledge what the other person is saying. To actually, you know, one thing that I have found um, as a librarian and a library director is it's great when someone actually takes the time to have an issue with something we did. And what I mean by that is there are so many people that are completely ambivalent to what it is that happens in the, in the public library. It would be great if everyone loved it, but even if people disagree with it, it is such an opportunity because that is someone who actually cares about what the library is doing. So I try to start every interaction like that off with just a, I really think it's wonderful that you are this interested in what it is that your child is reading and what it is that your child is being exposed to. There are a lot of parents that don't feel that way. And thank you for taking the time to talk to me about this. Honestly, if you start off with that, very often the person will just, they will come down. It gives you a chance to gather and it, it takes it to a different place because then it's, you've identified that there is this area of commonality that, hey, we both care about kids. We both care about your child. Let's start from that. Mm -hmm. and move forward. So that, that, that's how I try to handle it in my suggestion. Thank you. Okay. Okay. I want to thank you all for attending. Uh, we appreciate it. Thank you, panelists, for being a part of this and um, giving folks the information they need.